Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly want to thank everybody for, for coming here. This is a, a big day for uh, our committee, uh, both of our committees, as well as for the GAO. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Senator Carper's train's been delayed and, and uh, Congressman Cummings is, is walking over, but we'll get started so we stay on time. Um, this, this, is a, this is a big day from the standpoint of our committee because so much of our work really does end up relying on the good work of uh, uh, Comptroller General Gene Dodaro and the, the Government Accountability Office. Um, since 1990, the GAO has been publishing its high-risk list. And uh, I asked my staff to uh, check into, you know, what, what kind of savings do, do we realize from the GAO's recommendation? And just in the last two years, uh, the federal government has, through efficiencies and, and through be better effectiveness because of GAO's recommendation, has saved $40 billion. I mean, that's, that's a significant savings. Uh, as we are assembling our, our staff for uh, this chairmanship, I, I did ask one of my staff members to go into the GAO reports and, and start reviewing those, and I went on the website to just really kind of narrow down what, what were the, the reports I really wanted to, to highlight and, and I noticed there were 52,942 reports. And so I gave, I gave my staff member that, that task. Of, How far are you on that one, Patrick? Yeah, he's, he's working his way through it. But the GAO is, again, such an important organization. I, uh, here's uh, Congressman Cummings. Come on up here, sir. Um, good morning. How are you doing? Uh, you know, GAO is, is, is just so important term, in terms of the work we do, and the high-risk list is all about identifying agencies and areas of the government that are vulnerable to waste, to fraud, to abuse, to mismanagement, and again, it's all about providing recommendations for greater effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, this year, uh, unfortunately, there are some new uh, agencies, new areas that are added to the list. Uh, one is VA Healthcare, and I'll come back and talk about that a little bit. Uh, also, uh, Information Technology Acquisition. Uh, they've expanded their uh, uh, work on, on tax code enforcement and fraud, and also on cybersecurity. That'll be a top priority of, of our committee is working on, on cybersecurity bill. Uh, but they also have uh, s some good news. They've narrowed their focus on uh, Department of Defense contracting management and also on FDA oversight of, of medical devices. And, I'm also pleased to report that uh, DHS management, uh, the focus on that one is, is being narrowed and uh, getting close to being taken off the list, hopefully. So I, I did want to point out, though, uh, one, one of the troubling aspects of this, this report really is VA health care. And this, this hits pretty close to home here in Wisconsin. We've had, over the last couple of years, in, in one facility, the, the Thomas facility in, in Wisconsin, we've had three deaths of veterans, two, two over the last couple of years. Uh, related to over-prescription over of opiate drugs. And just last month, uh, a veteran, 74 years old, basically died in neglect. He, he was taken to the facility with, with symptoms of a stroke, waited for three hours, had a stroke, was put into an examination room, waited another 45 minutes, never got the anticoagulant drug, was transported to Gunnison Lutheran where he died a couple days later. So what's, what's troubling about the, the GAO high-risk report on, the, on VA health care is they have been making recommendations, the GAO has been making recommendations on VA health care for a number of years. More than 100 of those recommendations have not been implemented, about 80%. And so th this has really got to be a focus. Um, this is extremely important that we provide the health care to, to the finest among us that they actually deserve. So I'm hoping that the VA starts taking the GAO's recommendations seriously. And I'll just close by saying I think what our committee can do and what hopefully uh, uh, Congressman Chaffetz's and Congressman Cummings' committee can do is, is try and figure out a process to make sure that the GAO recommendations are actually implemented. We, we can write all these reports, but the agencies actually have to pay attention and they have to implement these reports if they do the government is far better off. It, be, it can become more efficient, more effective, and that's a goal that we all share. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Chaffetz. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, and I appreciate the good work Senator Johnson and uh, those in the Senate are doing. We've got a, a great working relationship, uh, and it, it's very important that the, the House and Senate work together on these, on these uh, issues. 
Uh, I also really appreciate the, the relationship that I have with Elijah Cummings and, and the partnership that we have. We're not going to see eye to eye on every issue, but we are going to work together. And, and certainly as we tackle waste, fraud, and abuse, that is not a, a purely partisan issue. That is something that we collectively uh, do need to work on. Uh, to the men and women of the GAO, we cannot thank you enough for the great work that you do. Congress can't do its job if the GAO doesn't do their job. And there are thousands of people who dedicate themselves to uh, the good hard work, the analysis, and the recommendations that we rely on, con in, on in Congress uh, to make sure that we're improving government and we're improving uh, the responsibilities and, and that we have to taxpayers. And that's what it's all about. It's about making government more efficient, more effective, more responsive to the American people. And so this report we rely on heavily, and, and we do appreciate the good work that our comptroller has done, uh, uh, Mr. Dodaro, we, we really do, uh, do appreciate it. Uh, in the House, I can tell you, oversight and government reform, we're, we're supposed to not only be highlighting through oversight, but we're also supposed to be in, introducing the reforms necessary. Uh, of deep concern are the six different programs uh, in five different agencies that are on the 25-year list. Uh, we're having the silver anniversary uh, and for, for six of these programs, that is totally unacceptable. So today uh, at 2 o'clock in the House, Mr. Dodaro is going to come testify. And then panel two, we've invited those agencies to kind of to come and try to explain themselves. 25 years on the list is wholly unacceptable. I, I'm interested, I, Mr. Dodaro can, can uh, expand on this, but to get off the list, there are five criteria. Leadership commitment, agency capacity, an action plan, monitoring efforts, and progress. Doesn't say that the whole thing has to be wiped out and solved, but those are achievable goals. For agencies to be on the list after 25 years, we got to solve that problem. We can't keep bringing them back year after year after year. These reports mean something, they need to be responsive. So, Today we'll hear from the uh, IRS about Medicare, we'll talk to the DOD, they have two on the list, uh, the Department of Energy and, and as well as uh, NASA. So we look forward to that as well. Again, to, to the good work from the men and women in the GAO, this is not a one-off hearing. This is something we need to work on throughout the 114th Congress and we'll do so in a, in a bipartisan and bicameral way. And so thank you, Senator, for ha having us and hosting us here. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Senator uh, Johnson, to Ms., uh, and thank you, Congressman Chavis, Mr. Dodaro, and I'm sure Mr. Carper, Senator Carper will be here soon. I um, just wanted to mo take a moment again to thank the employees of the GA jail. I've said it quite often, our federal employees uh, so often are talked about in a very negative way. Uh, but uh, I've been a staunch supporter of our federal employees because they bring so much to the table and make such a big difference. And the GAO report is one such excellent product. But you know you can have motion, commotion, emotion, and no results. That's what, that's what Senator Johnson was talking about uh, and uh, Congressman Chaffetz. Uh, it's time that we do something that actually takes these things off the list. Uh, I was very pleased to see that, well, pleased and not pleased to see cybersecurity uh, on that list. It's clear that we have to address this issue, and Senator Johnson, I was very glad to hear you say that uh, this is something that your committee would be taking on. Um, cybersecurity affects our constituents on a day-to-day -day basis. If it does not affect them directly, it makes them feel vulnerable. It opens up their private lives to so many, many hackers. And we've got to address that issue. But overall, I've, I've, everywhere I go, I try to tell the American people, I got your back, that I got your back. And every time I say that, every time I say it, I get a standing ovation because that's what the American people want. They want to know that we come in here and that we not only keep government straight and make sure that government is doing the right thing and has a very high standard, and as Senator Johnson said, 
operates in an effective and efficient manner. But they also want to know that governors make a difference in their lives. And when you go to the various recommendations that GAO has recommended, and Mr. Dodaro will talk about this afternoon, the, most of those things go to changing the trajectory of people's destinies. And that's what this is all about. And so um, I'm going to work, and I'm very pleased that we have a, a good relationship uh, with the chairman. Uh, it is, uh, it's refreshing, to be very frank with you. Uh, I think we are going to be able to accomplish many, many things. But I always remind my colleagues that we are only in these positions for a short period of time, whether it's five years or whether it's 100 years. And during that time, it is up to us to make a difference. And there is no better guiding light than the GAO report. So the question now is, do we use that light to make a difference? Or do we put it on the shelf and wait till next year and complain that the things haven't been done? Or do we make a difference in people's lives? And I would submit to you that with the bicameral relationship that we now have, I think we'll be able to achieve a lot. And so, again, I want to thank you. I'm going to uh, look forward to our committee meeting this evening. I want to thank Mr. Chaffetz for uh, agreeing already to many of the things that uh, we are concerned about on the Democratic side and all of those things that we have uh, asked to be considered, some of which come from the list, are things that go to the center of people's lives. And thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be invited here today uh, to this press conference to talk about our update of the high risk list, which we do at the beginning of each new Congress. Uh, this year, we're showing and reporting solid, steady progress in the majority of the areas on the high risk list. As been mentioned, we have introduced a new feature this year where we're rating each of the high risk areas on the five criteria that Conver uh, Congressman Chaffetz enumerated. Leadership commitment, where they have the capacity, the people, the resources to actually fix the problem, where they have a good corrective action plan that addresses the root causes of the problem, and they can monitor it over time. They need a monitoring effort, and they need to demonstrate progress. They really don't need to have it 100% fixed, but they have to be uh, demonstrate tangible results in fixing the problem and on the road to ultimate solutions. While, as been mentioned, uh, six of the original 14 areas from 1990 are still on the high risk list, uh, one third of the areas we've added over time have been able to come off of the high risk list through concentrated efforts, support from the Congress, legislation, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, it is a bit of an urban legend that if you get on the GAO high-risk list, you can never come off. Uh, there are areas that have come off. None are coming off this update, however. Uh, but of the 30 areas that were on the list, 18 have at least partially met all five criteria. And 11 of those 18 have fully met one of the criteria or more and partially met the others. As been mentioned, we're narrowing the focus on two areas. FDA's oversight of medical devices. In that area, they have fully implemented our recommendations in the recall area. Before they were not focused on the recall area enough, they are now consistently applying their criteria for recalls. They're ensuring that the explicit criteria that they have for what needs to be done during the recall is actually followed through and they're documenting it. They're analyzing 10 years of trends and recall data so that they can provide better guidance and support to the industry uh, in these areas. They've also uh, implemented fully a new law that allowed approval of new devices to go through a, a dual track process. If the device was similar to devices already approved, it could go through an expedited process. If it wasn't, it had to go through a more stringent process. They were slow to implement uh, this law. They've now, by uh, 2015, they're on track to fully implement the legislation. There are two aspects of that area that are still important. One is um, oversight to improve their uh, ability to manage the safety of drugs in a global marketplace. 
Most of the drugs that we have now, 80% of the ingredients for active drugs, 40% of finished drugs, half of medical devices, come from 150 countries around the world. So they need to pivot from overseeing domestic production to overseeing global production, and also focus on drug shortages, which are still a problem. Congress has passed some legislation in this area, but it needs to be attended to. In defense, contract the management area, we're narrowing the focus. They finally have oversight over the contracting tools and techniques to use less risky contracts when it's appropriate, uh, but they still need to make improvements in oversight in their acquisition workforce, services acquisition, which are growing as a proportion of, of their acquisitions, uh, and also operational contract support, where they're using contractors in theater to help carry out and execute military op operations. Uh, while we've noted progress, there are two areas that are coming on the high risk list, has been noted VA healthcare uh, is on the list. Uh, we've grouped our findings over the years into five areas that are real problems. Ambiguous policies and inconsistent processes, inadequate oversight and accountability, information technology challenges, uh, inadequate training of VA staff, and unclear resource needs and allocation priorities. As Senator Johnson mentioned, we have over 100 recommendations that we've made that have not yet been fully implemented. Congress has passed legislation to help address this area, but it needs to be effectively implemented. VA has been given an additional $15 billion. We want to make sure, and one of the reasons we're putting it on the list, is that that money goes to proper use and actually helps remedy the problem. Uh, the other uh, new area that we're putting on the list are IT acquisitions and operations, both new systems but also how they're managing existing legacy systems. Over $58 billion of the $80 billion each year actually go to support ongoing systems and operations, and we're concerned that's not being managed effectively. As it relates to new areas, uh, we provide a, a litany of uh, failed government efforts that after millions and in some cases billions of dollars and several years of development have been canceled. There's a lot of cost growth and schedule slippages in other areas, and ultimately, in many cases, the systems are developed with less functionality than intended, and therefore don't make a real improvement in execution of the mission of the agencies. In this area, over just the last five years alone, we've made 737 recommendations. Only 23% of those have been fully implemented. Congress has passed late last year uh, with sponsorship of both the Senate and House committees that are represented here today, uh, new legislation to help in the IT reform area. It's called the FATARA legislation, and it gives CIOs more authority and puts a number of other tools and techniques in place that we think would be helpful. But again, it needs to be executed properly. Congress has done its job in both the VA cases and the IT area, but it's up to the agencies now to successfully execute. Lastly, uh, two areas we're expanding, which we've done over time as circumstances change. Uh, first is in the uh, uh, tax enforcement area, tax administration. We have been focused on the tax gap, which right now the annual estimate's $385 billion. But uh, fraud due to identity theft has been growing. Uh, last year, IRS stopped, uh, they estimate, about $24 billion in potential fraud, and they missed about 5.8 billion. So we're concerned. We have a number of recommendations that we'll be talking about uh, with Congress for some potential legislative uh, fixes uh, in this area and things that IRS could do. Lastly, in cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection, we put uh, computer security across the federal government as a high risk list in 1997. It was the first time we ever said any, anything across the entire federal government was high risk. In 2003, we added critical infrastructure protection uh, to that because most of the computer assets are in the private sector hands, and the government needs to have a partnership with the private sector to protect critical infrastructure systems, and more of them have become reliant on computer technology, whether you're talking about the electricity grid or the operations of our financial markets. Uh, but the other dimension that's really 
uh, come into the forefront recently that we're adding is the focus on privacy and protecting personally identifiable information. The number of incidents has more than doubled in the last five years uh, to uh, over 27,000. So it's, and that's just reports by the federal agencies of incidents involving personally identifiable information. There have been obvious high profile incidents in the private sector as well. Privacy laws uh, were passed initially in 1974. They need to be updated. Uh, and uh, we have a number of suggestions, both for the Congress uh, and the executive branch agency. So uh, we look forward to and appreciate both committees holding hearings on this subject, and we look forward to working with the Congress uh, and the agencies to come off the list. I would note uh, some of the progress that we've seen has been due to uh, top leadership commitment in the agencies and by OMB and, of course, by the many uh, my great colleagues at, at GAO with the hard work. So I want to publicly thank uh, everyone for their support, and Congress has passed a number of important legislative uh, initiatives which we outlined in our report. So thank you very much. Uh, before we open it up for questions, I see that our ranking member, uh, Senator Tom Carper, has arrived. Before I call him up here, I just had a couple more comments. Uh, you'll notice that there seems to be a fair amount of bipartisan agreement of really how important GAO, GAO's work is, and that's true, and that's a good sign. You know, if we're going to really accomplish things for the American people, like uh, Ranking Member Cummings was talking about, it's good to concentrate on the things we agree on, and, and we have a real good opportunity in both of our committees to do just that. Uh, working with Senator Carper, we've, we've actually developed a mission statement for our committee. It's pretty simple. It's to enhance the economic and national security of America, and GAO is a key part of that. Now, now, Senator Carper and I, we may not agree on, on how big the government ought to be, but we fully agree on that what government we have should be efficient, should be effective, and we are committed to working together to trying to accomplish exactly that. So with that, uh, Senator Carper. Please hold your applause. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jason, uh, welcome. Always nice to, nice, nice to be with you and my friend Elijah. And uh, to Gene as well, as well. Notice Gene Dodaro, when he speaks, uh, he uses copious notes. He never looks as an audience. And uh, you know, I, it's, I've been with him, I don't know how many times over the last dozen or so years. And I've never seen him use a, one note to say anything. And everything flows uh, uh, so, uh, so, so smoothly. And we, something we all aspire to be, uh, to be better at. But uh, not only is he a, a great presenter of of information and important information in a way that I can understand and I think most people can understand and appreciate. He provides great leadership with thousands of folks who work at the General Accountability Office and do uh, wonderful work, important work for, uh, for, for, for our country. I used to be state treasurer a long time ago and, and it came to the Congress for a while and I, if anything I focused on it was uh, uh, deficit reduction. I've always uh, been interested in how do we get better results for, for, for less money. I did the same thing as Governor of Delaware and those eight years, we had eight years of balanced budgets. Seven years, we cut taxes, paid down some of our debt, and earned up uh, earning a AAA credit ratings for the state of Delaware for the first time in the history of, uh, of our state. And I bring that spirit of, uh, really, the spirit of a recovering governor here to, to my work in the United States Senate with members of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee and with our friends in, in the House of, of Representatives. I, uh, people ask me sometimes, they say, what do you like most about your, your work? And there's a lot of things I, I, I enjoy about my work. Sometimes I don't enjoy the commute so much from Wilmington to, uh, to Washington when the trains aren't working. But uh, that's uh, one, of the, one of your primary recommendations that really struck home with me this morning is that we have some work to do with the Congress with respect to making sure that we're investing appropriately in our transportation system for, for this nation. And I would certainly amen that to, uh, to today. The, uh, uh, but I, uh, I, I focus hugely on deficit reduction, and, and one of the things that, that, uh, that we need to do, uh, really three things we need to do in order to, uh, to continue to reduce our, our budget deficits. They're down by about two-thirds from where they were four or five years ago, but there's more work that needs to, to, to be done. First thing we need to do is entitlement reform that uh, saves these programs, saves these programs, saves money in these programs, saves these programs for, for, uh, for future generations and does not harm um, older people or, or poor people. Uh, number two, we need uh, comprehensive tax reform that makes our, broadens our base, lowers our rates, especially on the corporate side, and also provides at least some monies for deficit uh, reduction. The third thing we need to do is to look at everything we do in government from A to Z, from A to Z, and ask this question, how do we get a better result for less money? 
you all heard the old saying, if you don't know where you're going, any path will take you there. Um, the great thing about uh, GAO and the work that Gene and his folks do is they give us a, a path. Oh, they give us actually several paths. But all of them lead to providing service to the people of this country in a more cost-effective way. It's critically important work, especially when you have a budget deficit that's still expected this year to exceed $400 billion. I uh, remember meeting with uh, Joe Lieberman. I'd just been elected. I was governor of Delaware. I'd been, just been elected to the U.S. Senate, and I met with Joe Lieberman. And we were talking about committee assignments and committees that uh, I might want to uh, aspire to serve on. He said, you ought to get on uh, 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 governmental affairs, in, uh, and, and uh, you'd like that. As an old treasurer, governor, he said, that's be right up, uh, right up your alley. And uh, I, uh, we talked a good deal about it, and I really thank him for that recommendation. Later on, we became Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. But, uh, but every day, every day, we can make progress toward providing the, uh, the taxpayers of this country a better return on their investment. Every now and then, I talk to folks uh, who pay taxes in, in this country, and a lot of people do. And uh, sometimes people say, I don't mind paying taxes. I just don't want you to waste our money. I don't mind paying taxes. I just don't want you to waste my money. I don't want to waste your money either. And with the help of GAO, we're going to waste a whole lot less. And we have been, in fact, uh, a whole lot less. Steve mentioned, Gene's mentioned a whole bunch of areas. I'll just men mention a couple of, of critical ones. We're actually uh, seeing progress being made. We're seeing progress being made uh, in the Department of Homeland Security, which actually has had clean audits not one, but two years in a row. Well, you can't measure, you can't manage, and DHS is making real progress. We're proud of that work and know it needs to continue. Uh, even in the Department of Defense, uh, progress is being made in terms of uh, supply management and work that they're doing in contracts and, and work with, re with, uh, with, with respect to other aspects of, of, of their job. That work needs to, to continue, but it's, it's in encouraging. Uh, uh, Ash uh, Carter is expected to be confirmed this week as Secretary of the Department of Defense, and I'll be speaking with him either later this week or later this month. And one of the focuses I'll have with him is continue the work that Leon Panetta and Chuck Hagel and others have, have begun in the leadership of your department. And the, the last thing I'd say is this, leverage. I love uh, the word leverage. I love to find ways to, to get, uh, achieve leverage. When, I, when Tom Coburn and I were leading a, a subcommittee of this uh, committee for a number of years, Committee on Financial Management, uh, we realized, uh, it didn't take as long to realize, if we could somehow leverage our effectiveness with uh, GAO, working off of the high risk list from GAO, working with the inspector generals, working with non-profit uh, non uh, groups, uh, we could actually get a lot done. Work with our colleagues in the, uh, in the House, work with the administration, work with OMB, we can get a whole lot done. And that's exactly what we've been doing. And for the last two years, Tom and I did that, Tom Coburn and I did that, leading the full uh, committee, and I look forward to doing that with Ron and working with Elijah and Jason uh, as, as well. Uh, a, lot, uh, a lot has been accomplished. A lot still needs to be done. And uh, by working together, uh, we're going to achieve that. Thank you. And now, let's just open it up to your questions, please. Anyone? We go, go ahead and identify yourself again, please. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for coming and asking a question. <laughs> I, I'll just mention mention a couple of them. We, as, as a, my lesson coming out of the election, uh, were really three lessons. One. Uh, voters want us to work together. Two, they want us to get things done. Three, they want us to, uh, to uh, do things to help strengthen the economic recovery of this country. Uh, a big, uh, a big uh, contributor to uh, economic growth is a, a modern 21st century transportation system. And we desperately need one. And we are finding it difficult to muster the courage and resolve to actually address, fully address this, uh, this, this, this issue, this need. We're getting another nudge from, from Gene and his folks. We need to do our job. And I've been working with a bunch of our colleagues, Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate, the administration, even into last night to try to provide a little bit of leadership on, on my own. That is a critical thing. And we've, I want to just say very much thanks to, uh, to Gene for, for highlighting that and, and reminding us we have a job to do. We need to do it. And let me yield to, to, to others. Uh, one thing that I've always been concerned is DOD and the ability to uh, count what they're spending and for, it, for us to be able to uh, have some accountability. Um, I was just double checking with Mr. Dodaro, uh, and they still are having the problems that they've been having. Um, I think that we need to stay on top of that. It's, um, 
you know, we spent a lot of money in, in DOD. Uh, and I think the American people would be a bit surprised if they uh, knew of the, the issues that, that uh, we have there. Let me just make the point, because I, I kind of got distracted earlier. There's no doubt about the fact that we have to make sure we implement these recommendations. And you know, obviously, when somebody's been on the high risk list for 25 years, it means they're not implementing the recommendations. Uh, you know, oftentimes, we talk about cutting government. And we're really not talking about cutting. We're just reducing the rate of growth in spending. Uh, GAO is, is an agency we've actually cut. In 2010, their budget was $556 million. Uh, 2013, it was $480 million. Last year, it was $522 million. Now, I, I'm a fiscal conservative, but when, when you see that uh, uh, GAO saved $40 billion because of its recommendations just over the last two years, this is an agency that we, we shouldn't short shrift. You know, this is an agency we should fund, and I think if we would do that, if we can develop some kind of implementation process to their good work. I think that's, uh, that's how you get people off those 25-year uh, lists. Yeah. There's just a, a couple areas. Obviously, they're all important on, on the list, but uh, DOD occupies a special place. They have about the eight different areas on the list, So, and particularly given the fiscal challenges of dealing with our deficit and debt situation, they need to uh, continue to make improvements and accelerate improvements if they are going to have better business practices that more efficiently carry out their activities, because if they don't, it ultimately uh, short shri uh, shrifts the warfighter in terms of what's delivered to our military to carry out their responsibilities. So it has real consequences, dollars and cents. I'm very concerned about Medicare and Medicaid uh, issues. The amount of improper payments has increased uh, this past year to $124 billion. Uh, of improper payments. These are payments that uh, were made in the wrong amounts or shouldn't have been made at all. Medicare and Medicaid have increasing. They're about half of the improper payments. And if you add the uh, improper payments and uh, estimated problems in earned income tax credit, that's 75% of the improper payments. Now, I'm worried about Medicare and Medicaid because they're the fastest growing federal programs. And if we don't get a handle on eliminating these improper payments, uh, it, the problem will get bigger, not smaller, over time. And then lastly, I'd mention uh, we've had on the list for a while financing our nation's transportation infrastructure. Uh, that's a, a real important area that Congress needs to attend to. I know there's a lot of discussions on it, but we have an aging infrastructure, and we need to make proper investments and find a stable funding source uh, for that area. Any other questions? Sir. It, it will, be, by the way, be focused. Uh, Senator Rand Paul will uh, chair the subcommittee that's really going to be looking into waste, fraud, abuse, duplicated programs, that type of thing. Uh, you know, I think one of the more revealing Inspector General's reports really was from, from the tax department that showed just the earned income tax credit. I, I, I don't know the, the, the earlier figures, but there was, one, there was one address where you had, I think, 26,000, approximately, I have this off the top of my head, about 26,000 claims of credit for about $46 million to one address. Now, now that is ridiculous. So now this, this is something, again, the American taxpayer does expect us to, to spend their money wisely, and we need to do everything we can to eliminate that, that fraud. We will be holding hearings on that. That's a huge focus of uh, Senator uh, Paul's subcommittee. We just, uh, just mentioned um, 26,000 checks going to one address. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we put a cap in place. Uh, I think the, the cap is the max is three. Um, it used to be that people go to the pharmacy shop uh, and, uh, and uh, use Medicaid money uh, in order to obtain uh, controlled substances and, and basically sell them part of the illegal drug, uh, drug market. Uh, we don't let people do that anymore. You've got to choose one pharmacy, and, and that's the pharmacy that you'll be, uh, you'll, that you'll be using. There are, uh, it's, little, it's a little bit like playing whack a mole at Rehoboth Beach at Funland. And as soon as you knock down one, uh, one uh, uh, fraud or one abuse, 
That's another one pops uh, pops up. This is just it just it doesn't really stop. And Tom Cobra and I started working on this, gosh, about six years ago. First bill that we passed, maybe even more than more than six years ago. First bill that we passed said basically federal agencies, you, we want you to uh, identify improper payments. That's what we first said. George W. Bush was president, so they started identifying improper payments. And later on, we passed another piece of legislation that said. We want you to not only identify improper payments, but we, we want you to stop making them. All right, so, and, and then later on, a, a third piece of legislation was enacted. It said, not only do we want you to identify improper payments and stop making them, we want you to recover money that has been improperly paid, and we want you to uh, recognize and promote employees, supervisors, on the basis in part because of their commitment to, to improper payments. All that is in place. There's still a lot going on. I, I will say this. For the first half a dozen years or so after we passed our first act, improper payments went up, 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 up. It peaked out at about $120 billion or so. And then they began coming down. And the reason why they're going up is that agencies were identifying improper payments. That's why more and more and more. And as they identified them, they, they went up. And then they, the numbers started coming down until this year, until this last, uh, last year. The one that, that concerns me the most is Medicare. It's Med Medicare. It went up by $15 billion. And uh, we've, I've talked to Sylvia Matthews Burwell. Secretary of the Department, talk with Beth Colbert, who's a deputy over at OMB, say, we got to get, uh, we got to get on this and, and work it. Tom Colbert, I'll mention his name one last time. And uh, Tom and I introduced in the last Congress something called the PRIME Act, P-R-I-M-E. Had 25 co-sponsors here in, in, the, uh, in the Senate. And mostly we, we focus on improper payments uh, with respect to Medicare and Medicaid. We never got it. We got it through. It was actually in the, uh, the SGR bill. It was attached to the SGR bill on, on the doc fix. Could not get that passed. And this year, we're going to move it again. We'll probably move it by itself. And we're going to invite uh, Chairman Chaffetz, and we're going to invite ranking uh, member uh, uh, Cummings to join us in, in introducing. Maybe we can jointly introduce that legislation and get it done. That'll help. It won't solve the whole problem, but it'll help um, further reduce the improper payments, and we need to.